Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. If you remember, last week we finished uh, uh, just when we started discussing the descent of Jesus alayhi salam. And we said that this will happen when the Imam moves his army to Quds and takes the city. And then Jesus will descend and uh, he will try to convince people that he is Isa alayhi salam and he backs Mahdi because certainly he would need this support and backing especially in a couple of years after this he would need this support very very uh, strongly now we said that it's probably in Al-Quds where Isa alayhi salam will descend and will bear witness for Mahdi his testimony is of tremendous importance for convincing the people in the West. However, when we say the people in the West, it means the Christians. But the majority, as they are, will be secular. And there is a trouble there with that secular people who reject Isa, who reject whatever is uh, related to faith and to Mahdi and Islam and Christianity and whatever. And that makes a big problem which comes in future. Uh, according to some traditions, the following verse in Surah Ali Imran alludes to this event. This is a very interesting uh, and controversial verse. When, of course, the Surah says that they said that we have crucified uh, Isa, but they did not crucify him. There was a confusion, they crucified someone else and they thought that he was Isa. And then the verses, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا Certainly they did not kill him. For sure, they did not kill him, this is what I can tell you, but there was a confusion. They killed someone else. Rather, what happened? بَرَّفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا Allah raised him up towards himself. And Allah is almighty, all wise. We don't know what's the meaning of this, raised him to himself. Uh, has he gone to the world of Barzakh with his body? This is what the most traditions say, that he is, for example, in the second heaven, something like that. You know, these heavens are not skies, are not heavens. as we. These are different layers of the world of Barzakh. And therefore, most of the people will be in the first layer of Barzakh, that's the Sama al Dunya. However, there are people who go further down, deeper into Barzakh. That's, for example, Isa alayhi salam, Idris alayhi salam, and uh, uh, there is a nice tradition from the Prophet who says, when I went to Miraj, in the seventh heaven, that's the seventh layer of Barzakh, where it's actually neighboring, it is neighboring the the world of Akhirah, the Jannah. He says, I saw a very honorable man sitting there, a middle-aged man, on an armchair. I asked Jibreel who this man is sitting in the neighborhood of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, this is your father Ibrahim. He, he is here and when you die, you will come here. And when the mu'minun of your ummah die, they will come here. In this layer of barza, of course, Proper mu'minun, not people like me. Proper mu'minun, they will go there and sitting there. Now, whether Isa, what's the meaning of this verse? Allah raised him to himself. Is he living on this earth like Khadr alayhi salam, for example? Or no, he has been taken. Everything about Isa is extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, his birth, his talking in the cradle, his miracles, giving life to the dead and everything so... This is another miracle of Isa, living in Barzakh with his body. Is it possible? We don't know. Probably living somewhere with the prophets. Now, بَرَّفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَزِيزًا حَكِيمًا وَإِن مِّنْ أَحْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ قُلْ لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِدًا There is none among the people of the book but will surely believe in him before his death. Now, believe in him before his death. Before whose death? Before whose death? Before Isa's death or before his own death? Now, this is what usually uh, has brought the confusion to this verse. That what does it mean? No one among the people of the book 
would be there except they believe in him before his death. Certainly it cannot refer to their own deaths because we know that many Jews and Christians, Ahlul Kitab, they die without any faith or they die without believing that Isa is not son of God. They believe that he is son of God. Therefore, the verse alludes to the fact that the Ahlul Kitab will see him and will believe in him before his death. And therefore the ayah would be one of the signs of the second coming of Isa salam that Ahlul Kitab, not seculars, not secular people, not atheists, not these, we are not talking about all the people in the West, certainly, or in the East, we are talking about Ahlul Kitab, those who still believe in the book. There is none among them that they will believe in him before he dies. That means they will see him and he can convince them that he is Isa, that he is Jesus and he has come back. So they believe in him. Now there's a very interesting uh, story here. I have mentioned it because it's uh, uh, a very telling anecdote about uh, uh, the way people understood this verse is a uh, Hajjaj. Shahr ibn Husha was a fairly uh, reputable scholar of uh, Hajjaj's time, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, the brutal, the brutal and ruthless uh, ruler of Iraq. Uh, of course, he had some knowledge of the Quran, and that's why he is discussing this with Shahr ibn Husha. And interestingly enough, uh, there are three theories about who collected the Qur'an for, uh, from the Orientalists who do not accept the traditional account of the collection of the Qur'an at the time of Abu Bakr. It's very interesting, they say it is either collected at the time by Hajjaj ibn Yusuf or by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad or by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. I don't know why they, are, they, they, they have come with such funny views. First of all, they thought that these things happen in the world of Islam by rulers, not by scholars. That's their first mistake. And secondly, they thought that who is the best person to nominate for collection of the Quran? Because this was something which really they detest. So three most detested people in the Muslim world, they say these are the people who collected the Quran. Now, let's put that aside. This Hajjaj had some knowledge of the Quran. Even Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad had some knowledge of the Quran and poetry and literature. Shahr says that, قَالَ لِأَ الْحَجَّاجِ يَا شَهْر آيَةٌ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ قَدْ أَعْيَتْنِي There is a verse in the book of Allah which troubles me. I said, which verse is that, O Amir? He said, وَأَمِّنْ أَحْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِ There is none among the people of the book unless they will surely believe in him before his death. And look what this ruthless man used to do. He says, I order a Christian or a Jew to be brought to me. And maybe probably he just wanted to see without any guilt. And I order them to be beheaded. To be killed. And then I look at them to see whether they say anything about Isa. They do, do they believe in him or not? So he says that, uh, by God I have had the Jews and Christians beheaded in front of me and did fix my gaze on them. But I did not see their lips to move until they died. So what's the meaning of this? I said, may God bring peace to Amir. It is not as you interpret. He said, how is it to be interpreted then? I said, Jesus will descend to this world before the day of judgment. Thereafter, no Jew or Christian will remain unless they would believe in him before his death. He will pray behind Mahdi. And he told me, who to you? How did you learn this? Because as I said, Hajjad had some knowledge of the Quran. Therefore, he was familiar with different interpretations of such verses. Who did you learn this? And where have you brought it from? I said, Muhammad ibn Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam al-Baghir salam, told me that this is the meaning of the verse. And then he, he was convinced then. 
although he was an enemy of these people, but he knew what the extent of their knowledge would have been. So he said, you have brought it from a pure source. And he, he accepted it. Anyhow, this event of Isa salam coming and all Ahlul Kitab believing in him would be amazing. I mean, not all Muslims would believe in Mahdi. We know that. That's, his first trouble is with the Muslims. And uh, the most troubling battles and wars that he have at the beginning is with the Muslims. We had two good states and bad states and then the fight and alliances which were made. And, uh, but uh, if this verse has the meaning which uh, we imagine, it's amazing about the Christians and the Jews, that they are convinced the way Isa alayhi salam. And when they are convinced, of course, they would not stop at Isa. They have to pass to Mahdi alayhi salam. I mean, because Jesus supports Mahdi. However, the point is they do not all convert to Islam. Mahdi accepts that they remain in their faith. However, we don't know what about the rulings, like the rules of uh, Torah, whether they would practice it or do not practice it. These are the things which are quite uh, confusing for us. We don't know it. Now, let's move on. Uh, in many traditions, that we have that Dajjal will be killed by Jesus. Now, who is Dajjal? Dajjal probably is not a person. Dajjal is from Dajjal or Dagal, we say. That, that is to, to deceive, to, to trick. And there are many people, uh, in traditions we are told there are many people who are Dajjal. This Dajjal, at, at this time, that we are uh, concerned about, we are told that he does very, very extraordinary things. He's like a magician. He brings things which fascinates people. He do things which people think this is the right man to be followed. And therefore, what we understand is that this Dajjal is the manifestation of the culture of the time. There, there may be many people as Dajjal there. But these are the people who fascinate everyone, who when they argue, when they put forward their values, people will be fascinated and they say, this is right. This is what we have to follow. They do not want to follow Isa salam or Mahdi salam. And this Dajjal will create lots of troubles. Now, would he be in the battles which are ensuing, which are going to come, or he would not be in the battles, he would be killed before that? We don't know, but probably yes, he would be killed in those battles. He is the, he is the one who actually musters all the forces around the world to come and fight against Mahdi and Isa alayhi salam. Now, uh, from Abu Ja'far alayhi salam, Sayati ala nas zamanun la ya'arifun Allah mahu. There will come a time when people do not know God. What is God? It's almost the time, isn't it? We have many people who argue. What, what do you, when you talk about God, what is it? Would it get worse than this? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it gets worse than this. The values have changed, certainly. You see some values which were, during the whole history of human being, the most abhorrent, indecent type of acts or things are now valued by the general culture of the world. Even in Muslim societies you see there are many people who are supporting the secular values of the West. So the values have changed. God of course is the secular society, just look at the France, look at France. I mean you cannot have a sign of God on you in a school, in an office, on an airplane. That's, you, you heard the story of that uh, hostess who had a cross on, uh, on her and they actually did not allow her. So these are the changes in value. And 
the people who talk about God are looked down at. They are the people who, are, who belong to the culture of the past. They do not know. They have to be civilized. These are uncivilized nations who still believe in God. And they have to be civilized. And what's the meaning of civilization? It is rejecting all these things. So, there will come this time. SubhanAllah, this is something which was not imaginable at that time. That people do not, even the mushrikun knew what Allah was. They believed in Allah, but they believed in other Arab lords. What Tawheed? They don't know what's Tawheed. Hatta yakun khurujud Dajjal. Then, of course, uh, this leads to the advent of Dajjal. And why Dajjal is successful? Because of the change of values. Because of the beliefs which prevail among people. And therefore Dajjal can really muster great force behind him, taking them. They have gay pride days, for example, as we have nowadays, and these things. And we, have to, we have to be alarmed by these things. Of course, uh, now we are in defensive, in the defensive, isn't it? I mean, you cannot talk about, even some Muslims talk about, yes, they are right, they have to. But these things have happened gradually. It was not conceivable that that day. وَحَتَّى يَنْزَلَ إِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ Again, this talks about Isa coming from the heavens, and that means from Barzakh. When, whenever you see Sama, it's Barzakh, not up to the skies and in, on, the other, on other planets. It's the heavens in which the angels live. And the heavens in which the angels live, most probably what I understand from the seven heavens, Sab'a Samawat in the Quran, are seven layers of seven dimensions of this world which is one inside the other. So the one which encompasses the other, خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ تِبْحَقَ It's one above the other, round the other. And therefore, when we talk about Sab'a Samawat, we talk about seven dimensions of this world which is one inside the other, and these are called Sama. So Isa is in one of these layers, dimensions. It comes, he comes from Sama. وَيَقْتُلُ اللَّهُ الدَّجَّالِ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ and Allah will kill, that, kill Dajjal on his hand. It's very important that he is killed on his hand. Because Dajjal comes from the West. And he is killed by Isa. And Allah have Dajjal killed by him. وَيُسَلِّ بِهِمْ رَجُلٌ مِنْ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Sorry, I, I have not put this translation of this last sentence. And at that time, a man from our Ahlul Bayt would lead their prayer. This is in line with all the other traditions we say. When Isa comes, a man from the Muslimun would lead in prayer. He prays behind him. That's the status of Mahdi, alayhi salam. Now, is Mahdi above Isa, alayhi salam? We keep silent. We don't know. We don't know. Why should we? engage ourselves in such futile discussions, who is above whom or what. But Mahdi says, the, Isa salam says, this is your ummah. You lead. I pray behind you. Fair enough. And he is the leader, of course. We cannot have two leaders. We have one leader only. So he is to lead this final generation. Oh, well, we don't know if it's final generation or not. He is to lead them to victory. So he should be supported by honorable people like Isa alayhi salam. Yeah, the, the translation is necessary. And at that time, a man from us, Ahlul Bayt, will lead them in prayer. The descent of Jesus is very important for the final mission, since he will act as a judge between the Imam and the Jews and Christians. And therefore, the Jews and Christians who cannot Except a Muslim would come and lead this final victory and lead them in this Armageddon, as they call it, at the end, then Isa salam would tell them, this is our Armageddon. We are both in it. So you, you can follow. You can follow us. Ibn Hamad reports from the Prophet, 
peace be on him, I swear by the one in whose hand is my life. Jesus will surely descend to you as a just arbitrator and ruler. So he is an arbitrator and ruler because yes, he is with Mahdi, they are ruling together. Of course the leader is Mahdi but he is a new ruler as well. He will break the cross and kill the swine. Of course you would not expect that he kills all swines in the world. It's, it's symbolic that probably he, he kills a swine and saying that this is forbidden to you from now on. And lift the tax, that's jizya, of course, this tax is jizya, because the jizya were for Ahlul Kitab, he lifts it, says now equal, you live equally with Muslims. The people will become so well off that no one will accept charity anymore. Now we talk about this affluence later on. This comes later, not at this stage. According to some traditions, Jesus will die in a man's lifetime. A public funeral will be held for him and the Imam will bury him beside his mother in uh, Palestine. Yeah, who would die before who? Because of course Mahdi, Mahdi is not going to live forever so he will die as well. According to some traditions Jesus dies before Mahdi and Mahdi would bury him. And this is very important. This is very important for those who still think that Jesus is son of God. That he dies and is buried in this public funeral where the whole world is watching, of course, that he has died. And this is, of course, again, a corroboration of what we said in the verse. وَإِمِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ They believe in him before he dies. So he would die and probably that time. Now, now, what about the secular West? The seculars, these are the most dangerous enemy now. Not Jews, not Christians, not Muslims who are now finished their opposition, of course, to some extent. Now, when the secular West, after Isa a.s., makes the arbitration and calls people to Isa and then the worldwide support comes from the minorities in the West who are still believing in God and believe in Jesus and so on and so forth, then now this is dangerous. Now the West wants to show that we do not tolerate you. And of course, what they have is far beyond what the Imam has. Far beyond it. The coming of Jesus is a very good opportunity to call the Christians to Islam. To use the full potentials of this opportunity, the Imam would make a peace treaty with the West. Now, you know how the seculars are. They test the waters. Now, now we don't know what's going to happen. Let's make, let's make a peace treaty. They make a peace treaty so that the Muslims and Christians could communicate freely and discuss the matters of faith. We have this sort of interfaith dialogue going at the time of Imam, very lively sort of dialogue between Muslims and Christians. They accept each other. And uh, this peace treaty, of course, is very important to convert as many people as is possible in all the world. I mean, in the East and the West and whatever, in China, in uh, Indonesia, in Poland, uh, wherever in the world. This, this sort of engagement with the world is going to happen. During this peaceful time, Jesus will probably visit different Christian communities in the West and in the East as well to bring them the new message and bring about a better understanding between the two communities. Uh, this peace treaty, however, will be violated by the secular West after a couple of years. Or in many traditions we have after nine months. This would last not more than, not less than one, nine months, but between nine months to two years, the traditions vary. That this peace treaty would last, there is a peaceful sort of, probably what will happen, there will be a peaceful spread of the message. Which then, of course, rings the alarms for the secular people, that this is not tolerable anymore. 
we have to do something, especially they are instigated by some Jews who are Jews in name, in, in, uh, in race, not in faith. Because the Jews and Christians in faith, they believe in Jesus, in Jesus who are Jews in race, they instigate and they want the Palestine back. They want Al-Quds back. So, they will use their full military power to regain the Jerusalem for the Jews. Now, this is the most critical point in the advent of this uh, new message. In this confrontation, there is no balance of power as the West is strikingly stronger and far better equipped than the Imam. The Imam has come from where? From these. Iran and uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia, what do they have? If they put all their military power together, they cannot even, from now, if at the moment we are talk, thinking about this balance of power, they cannot even cope with, with one country like the US, for example. At that time, the West is even much stronger. And, of course, they don't want the war because, of course, everything is at stake. Like now, for example, they don't attack Iran. They can attack Iran, but the harm that they would receive is much beyond what they can take into uh, their calculation. So they don't do it. Otherwise, of course, Iran is not that strong as a country. And this is the same thing. They didn't want, but now things are getting out of control, their control. So they want to stop it. The traditions say that they attack from the sea, landing in Haifa and Akko, with 80 military divisions, with a force of 1 million men. Now, 1 million men might be something figurative. The swarms of soldiers and armies will come in. Because they want to finish this in the first attack finish this in the first attack and completely uh, put an end to all these troubles which has been made in the last few years from since the coming of the Imam. Just finish all the troubles and uh, the talk about God and these things. And uh, this will turn out to be one of the bloodiest wars in the world. Both sides will suffer. And we have in many traditions that whoever from the Mahdi side is martyred in this battle would have the reward of the Shuhada al Batr, the martyrs of the Battle of Batr. So important this because, because this is the, the the turning point in the history of human being. Any side wins would have won the world. The secularism would wins would have won the world. Imam wins would have won the world. Of course, with the predictions which are we are told, Imam is not going to lose. It's, it's like a film you are watching and you know who is going to win, who is going to lose. But we know by from traditions and these things that Imam is going to. But at that time, this is not quite clear. The attack and the weaponry which comes from the other side is so immense that everyone thinks that this is going to end in a couple of nights. They are going to put an end to this very swiftly and very quickly. Now, in which the Imam will have the support of God in the same way that the Prophet had in his battles. Now, here we are told that God is not going to leave the Imam. The angels will come as they came in Badr. Of course, in Badr, no one could see them. They came, Allah says, we sent you 3,000 of angels. They came and helped you, but no one knew. And everyone thought that this was a miracle. That these 313 people without weaponry, they won over that strong army. And this will happen in the same way. Imam doesn't have enough weaponry, doesn't have enough uh, military support as the West has. However, he has the support of God, certainly. He will be supported by fear, as the Prophet was supported by fear, the Rob. 
We have in tradition that Prophet said, I have been supported by fear for the distance of one month. What does that mean? It means whenever I move out, people who are one month away from me in the travel distance, they, they, they feel frightened. And this is what happens with the Imam. As soon as he starts moving a battalion or a brigade or something, all the armies will become terrified. And this, of course, fear is something which is the most corrosive thing for an army. This is one of the supports which Allah gives him. And the other things which are unseen, like what happened in Prophet's time, for example, in Bad Battle of Hunayn, Battle of Badr, which everything, everyone thought that it went naturally, but it didn't went naturally, we are told. So the same thing would happen here about the Imam, alayhi salam. In this battle, seeing the military superiority of the West, many Arab countries will join them against them. Well, you would expect that again. That's, well, look, you cannot even, even you, if you are right, you cannot cope with this. So let us go with the other side. Many will be killed from both sides in a fierce Armageddon. This is what actually we have in Christian uh, predictions as well. And many of these predictions that we have in our traditions, you can find similar things in the Bible. However, the point is they think Jesus is fighting against Muslims. Well, he's actually not. He is siding with Muslims against the seculars. Not against Christians or Jews or something. Against the secular West. But eventually the Imam and Jesus will be the victors of this war. Now, this puts an end to all oppositions. This now has actually uh, drained the whole military power of the secular force. And therefore, everyone now should concede and submit. The Imam will then move to the west and will visit different cities and will build mosques and will appoint leaders to rule on his behalf. So now the whole world is under him. Now, you would see that usually we are told that when Imam comes, he starts fighting, battles, killing. Now, in all these things that we had in our traditions, you never saw that Imam is starting a battle. He never wants to do this with force. He is always fought against, not fighting against anyone. He makes the peace treaty with the West, are very happy about it that now they can communicate, they, have, they can have dialogue and of course those dialogues you can imagine would go on the internet, would go on TV and all these things and this is what frightens the West actually. So you would see through all these uh, different phases, phases of his, uh, the only thing which he actually, the only aggressive act which he does is taking Al-Quds. This is what, of course, he has to do. He moves to take the Quds because it belongs to them. It belongs to Muslims and he takes it. And that, of course, brings lots of animosity as well from the other sides. Now, let's see... Now, of course, the world is in our hand, okay? And let's see how we want to rule. How we want to rule. Certainly not like Muslim countries now, much more advanced, much more sophisticated. So, what an account of the government of Mahdi alayhi salam. So, we are now moving to a next phase. We are finished with these battles and everything. We don't know how long this... Uh, gaining the control would take. But from traditions that we examined and the course of, course of events that we saw, it would take probably four or five years. That's, then everything comes under Imam's control. Or maybe less. Uh, there is a description about the way the Imam salam, would uh, want to direct the society in his time. 
And this is in Nahjul Balagha, the most beautiful description of what the Imam will do. يَعْطِفُ الْحَوَىٰ عَلَى الْهُدَىٰ إِذَا عَطَفُ الْهُدَىٰ عَلَى الْحَوَىٰ وَيَعْطِفُ الْرَعْيَ عَلَى الْقُرْآنِ إِذَا عَطَفُ الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى الْرَعْيِ He will make desires subservient to guidance, while people will have made guidance subservient to desires. So they follow their hawa. And guidance is interpreted in the way which conforms and goes nicely with their hawa, with their desires. So the huda, the guidance, is made subservient to desires. What he will do, he will turn this upside down. He will make desires to follow the Qur'an, subservient to the Qur'an. And he will make opinions to, to, to subservient to guidance, and he will make opinions subservient to the Qur'an after the people will have made the Qur'an subservient to their opinions. Now, you might say, what does it mean? You mean that, for example, the way we pray is not correct, and so we have to pray in another way, the way we fast? No. Qur'an is much more than this. It talks about justice, it talks about welfare and well-being of the people, it talks about merits which every human being should have and uh, talks about bad traits that every human being should put aside. Now what Imam will do, he will actually fulfill the potentials which are not fulfilled from the Quran. Quran has many aspects. These aspects are not met, are not yet fulfilled what he will do bringing opinions back to the Quran it doesn't mean that he changes the way we pray or fast or these things he will ask us he will demand us to submit to those very very important codes of the Quran which has been left up till that time without fulfillment without being followed by the people this term so the Qur'an and the guidance has many different dimensions. The Qur'anic guidance has potentials which have not been realized yet. As I said, no one should wrong anyone else. And we see how even in Muslim communities and societies people wrong others, even sometimes unknowingly. This potential has not been realized yet, so it should be realized. Then the Imam will realize the unfulfilled potentials of the book. Now, that is why people say this is a new book. The way you talk about the Quran is not way the way we will you we use to recite it or to read it or to understand it. Yes, because we understood it according to our desires. Now what he brings is that he brings the right understanding of the Quran. As I said, full potentials of this book will be realized in his time. Sure. Does that mean that there is a possibility that the interpretation is held at this time? Indeed, sorry? Does that mean potentially that the interpretation that we have at this time, right? And till he comes, which may be another 50, 100 years, God knows, Allah knows best. Uh, there is a potential danger that they may be, we may not be understanding it fully. Does that imply that? And if it does imply that, then my question is this, that how do we... Um, uh, it's not a potential danger, it's a reality actually. <laughs> okay, then, <laughs> then my question, if, it, that, if it's a reality, then my question is then, is it, is it just unavoidable? We just have to try our level best and just purify ourselves or, or the scholars have to just... I mean, we, you know, the, the implications of what you're saying are quite disturbing, if I may put it. Yeah. yeah certainly, and we can see that, that, you know, people are taking and talking about Qurans and, and, and saying there's a book that has passed this time, and, you know, gender issues, all sorts of issues that come. And this is happening today, that people are disputing the very essence of this is really, and maybe someone probably would go and say whether it really is a book or some, you know, 
Here, I'm talking about Muslim. I'm not talking about non-Muslims. I'm not talking about these controversial issues that we have now. We don't know. We want to. We don't want to settle it on the account of the Imam, <laughs> saying that if Imam comes, he changed the gender rules of the Quran or these things. No. We don't know when he comes, what he will bring, what interpretation he gives. We shouldn't prejudge according to our own opinions. When he comes, he will subservi- make our opinion subservient to the Quran. But yes, of course, this is, the, this is the disadvantage of the absence of the Imam, isn't it? If, if we are the same as the time of the Imam, then what's the need for him coming? So, so there should be a change, there should be a difference, certainly. However, we are not going to be punished for our wrong understanding because this is the amount of the, the extent of our uh, understanding, the extent of our efforts. This is what we can do. The best thing uh, we can do is try to understand the Quran without our desires. But you see, it's, it's always difficult. And uh, therefore, I mean, all these discussions that you see now going in the Muslim world is because they have different interpretations of the Quran, isn't it? I mean, there's a very beautiful uh, debate between Hisham ibn Hakam and uh, a man from Sham who, whose name is not mentioned in tradition, but probably he's, he was a very adept Muqtazili theologian. And uh, he came to, the, to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq and he said that tell your students to, to discuss or to, to, to start a debate with me. Of course he knew that he should have kept the respect of the Imam, not saying that I have come to, to argue with you or to have debate. He said tell your students and Imam, okay, said to different students of him, all of them actually defeated the man. But Hisham ibn Hakam was very different. He said that uh, after the Prophet, you say the Prophet is the one that you have to follow and he takes away, removes all differences. He said, yes. He said, who after the Prophet? He said, no one, the Quran. You follow the Quran after the Prophet. He said, you mean the Quran would remove our disagreements and misunderstandings? He said, yes. He says, so why have you come from Sham to discuss with us? We are disagreeing. <laughs> if the Quran was to take away the disagreements, why are we disagreeing with each other? And the man was dumbfounded. What, what should he say? He had come from Sham to talk about disagreements, and he said that, yes, the Quran would remove disagreements. So this is the disadvantage of... And then the man said, okay, you, who you say would be after the Prophet? He said, do you accept? He said, yes, it's this man. Imam Jafar said, this man. He will remove our differences, we have to all listen to him. And now that we don't have the Imam, oh, we have to wait for him to come and tell us who's right, who's wrong. And not everyone would accept, of course, his judgment. Uh, now, a few salient features that he is going to realize from the Quran. Features which are, of course, uh, not fulfilled completely. The first and foremost is justice, as we have in many traditions. This is actually what the world is waiting for. A man who will come and fills the earth with justice and equity after it has been filled with oppression and inequality. Zulm al this is what the whole world will be expecting from Mahdi alayhi salam and from the second coming of Jesus alayhi salam. Al Hafid Abu Nu'aym, this is uh, the respected Sunni scholar who has bring this tradition. Uh, the Prophet said, the hour will not pass. The hour is the, the Qiyamah, of course, the Sa'a. Uh, before a man from Ahlul Bayt will rule the earth, filling it with justice, after it's filled with oppression, he will rule seven years. Now, about the 
the rule of the Imam is not very long anyway. Some, the, the longest period which has been mentioned is 20 years. The shortest is 7 years. Now here these traditions of course that we examine, most of them say he would rule between 7 to 9 years. Now he will rule because it's a yam lakul arv. He takes the, the land, the, the whole earth. Now these 7 years or the longer period, is it after he establishes completely in the earth, after defeating the secular West, and then seven years, or right from the beginning? If it's right from the beginning, that means he lived very short time after everything is established, a couple of years, and then he would die. And what, what happens after him is another story. But whether the world would finish or it would continue, that's another story. And some descriptions, فَلَا يَتْرُكُ أَبْدًا مُسْلِمًا إِلَّا اشْتَرَاهُ وَعَتَقَهُ وَلَا غَارِمًا إِلَّا قَضَى دَيْنَهُ وَلَا مَظْلِمَةً لِأَحَدٍ مِنَ النَّاسِ إِلَّا رَدَّهَ No Muslim slave will remain unless he will buy them and free them. Now, are we going to have slavery at that time? Maybe this is something figurative or metaphorical, saying that everyone is going to be freed from the yoke of what controls them, no one in debt unless he will pay back their debts and no usurp right unless he will return it. So this is the meaning of justice. And of course there is a there is a wider meaning for justice and that is not worshipping God is injustice as we have in the Quran. For example Luqman saying to his son, Ya Bunaya La Tushrakibullah in Nashirka La Dulmun Adi Associating other gods with, with, with Allah is a big dhulm, is oppressing yourself. He would remove that as well. And also believing in wrong values is dhulm as well. He would remove that as well. He would bring the correct values. The values which Allah has taught human beings right from the beginning and they are all violated by the secular world. So after all these discussions, what we understand is that who is the most ferocious enemy of the Imam when he comes? It's the secular world. It's not Muslims or Christians. Of course there are some Muslims who fight against him like Sufyani. They are just uh, removing them is simple. It's the most ferocious enemy of Imam is the secularism. The secular West, which, who comes forward to to kill him. Now, remember what I said. All this story was an imaginable, an imaginable course of events. So, if Imam comes and these things don't happen, do not come to me and knock on my door and say, "Well, you said this, and I have to take you to Imam now, and you have to be tried or something like that." Second thing, which we have at the time of Imam, affluence, the world would produce such a wealth that, as in some traditions we have, they take it to people and say, take, and they say, no, thank you, we don't want it. It's a burden. We have enough. So this affluence, of course, it has never happened in, in the world up till now. There have always been people who have been hungry, who have been in need. But we are told that at the time of Imam, this would end. People, we don't have people below the line of poverty anymore. We don't have poor people anymore. Again, Al-Hafiz Abu Nu'aym and Abi Sa'id Al-Khudri and al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Annahu Qal يكون من أمة المهدي إن قصر أمره فسب أسنين وإلا فثمان وإلا فتسع يتنعم أمة في زمانه نعيما لم يتنعم مثله قط البر والفاجر. Now let's see what's the meaning of this. The prophet said.
Ah, something is missing here. I don't know what have I done. So let's go to the, the hadith. It says that uh, from my ummah there will be Mahdi. If his life, that means the life of his power, the life of his government. If it's short, now I think we have it from here. If it's short, he will rule seven years. Otherwise, eight or nine. Now, why this hesitation? Because again, this is one of those uh, uh, conditional things which is uh, which depends on the way the course of events go, and therefore the the prophet is hesitant as to how long he is going to rule. These may change. E even this eight and nine might change. It's bad might come. We don't know. My umma, both righteous and wicked. Now, therefore, we still have wicked people at the time of Imam. It's not that everyone will become good. However, everyone will be controlled in a way that wickedness cannot manifest itself, cannot prevail. It's the good which prevails, not wickedness. So, uh, both righteous and wicked will enjoy such comfort at this time that they have never experienced a comfort like it. That means the people on the earth have never experienced the sky pours rain over them in abundance and the earth would bring out its vegetation. Now we might say, is affluence good or bad? Is comfort good or bad? It's good. If you obey God, it's good. As we, you know who was telling his people. If you ask forgiveness from God, Allah will send abundance to you from the sky, rain, everything. Something like this. And He will give you children, property, everything. If the people. Now, this is actually the realization of this verse. If the people in cities were to believe and have taqwa. وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْ لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ We would have opened the doors of all affluence to them. But what they do, as soon as they become wealthier and more powerful, they start to oppress. They start to wrong others, they start to attack others, they start to make bombs and all these things. So we stop. We give just the amount that they can live, not more than that. And even that, just that, the amount that just they can live is appropriated by some people and accumulated as wealth here and there, and people go hungry. But when this taqwa and faith comes, there is then no hurdle, no barrier here for this affluence to come. So this affluence will come at the time of Imam alayhi salam and they will experience a comfort that they never have experienced before that. Of course don't think that this is going to be like Jannah. It still is this world. Not worthy anyhow. And then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa an Abi Sa'id. I don't know why I have messed up here. Anyhow, an Abi Sa'id. This is an uh, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa 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 Otherwise, nine. My ummah will enjoy such a comfort at this time that they have never experienced a comfort like that. The earth will expose its fruits. What's it? Tu'til ardu ukula. Ukul, the fruits, the, whatever the earth can provide. Now, this might be mines. 
uh, vegetation, many other things which we have not yet found. I, we, in a couple of hundred years ago, we found oil. And so you can see how rich we have become in this world. And we don't know what other thing the earth is going to expose at the time of Imam. Something better than uranium or something like that. We don't know. What is it still inside the earth that this greedy human being has yet not found? And it will be exposed at the time of the Imam. Okay. So, the earth would expose its fruits and would not treasure anything away from them. Now, not treasure anything. There are many things apparently now in the earth more precious than gold and silver and oil and other things that we yet have not found it. Thanks God. What if we had found it? We would have killed more people, isn't it? Thanks God, we haven't found it yet. That this will be found at the time of the Imam. The earth will expose all these things to people. Uh, you can then imagine what sort of industry we are going to have, the people are going to have. What sort of uh, technology they are going to have. I mean, all these things coming out. Uh, you just see, we have found one of the treasures of the earth, silicon chips, and what revolution it has created in the world of communication. Now, what else we can find in the earth which, are, which is going to create revolutions after revolutions? We don't know yet. We don't know. I tell you, it's still not like Jannah. Jannah's earth land is blessed. It's not like this earth. Of course, the earth is blessed as well. Allah said we have blessed the earth and you see what we can extract from this earth which is feeding people for hundreds of thousands of years and still there are things in this earth which we have to yet find and inshallah we'll find that at the time of the Imam the wealth is piled up in a way that a, a man of my ummah Something is missed here. Uh, that uh, yeah, it's probably missed its order. A man would go to Mahdi and says, "Give me." Now, when we say a man would go to Mahdi, we shouldn't think that Mahdi is sitting there and for people to go and no. I mean, the administration. That's the meaning of a man would go to Mahdi means the administration. The administration of Mahdi. They say, give me, I need such and such. And they say, take. What do you want? They open the door of the treasury, take what do you want. And that's why people would become, what a boring life, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's not going to be boring. But uh, this is how it is. So a man would go to Mahdi and says, give me, and he says, take. And we have many traditions like this, that you know, say, what do you want? And say, I want such and okay, take, whatever you want, take it. The second, the third thing, which we'll finish with this today, security. Now this is even more important than affluence and justice, security. Security, you are not going to be afraid of nuclear warheads anymore, battles, fightings. The verse that we discussed at the beginning of this course, Allah has promised those of you who have faith and do righteous deeds that He will surely make them successors in the earth, just as He made those who were before them. And He will surely establish for them their religion, which He has approved for them, and He will surely change their state of fear they will stay to security after they fear. So there will be no fear anymore. There will be absolute security in the world. Yes? You know saying that the Allah 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 yeah. Is this what this to is? Yeah. 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 This is what this is, it is. Yeah. Is this this is the government, which is the honorable, noble government of Mahdi Ali Salam. Uh, one tradition, there are many traditions. One tradition just. Uh, 
that uh, I chose to mention here. Walla dhahabat al-shahna min qulub al-ibad. Wastalahat al-sabah wal-bahan. The grudge and enmity will leave the hearts of the people. Qulub al-ibad. Now, if the grudge and enmity leaves the hearts, then there is no fighting, of course. There is always security. And the beasts of prey and the livestock will live in peace. Now, this is certainly metaphorical. As we have the lamb and the wolf will live together. Well, they cannot live together because then how the poor wolf should eat. Of course, <laughs> they have to eat lambs. Now, we always think that wolves are very evil animals. But uh, if we just put our, ourselves in the shoes of the lambs and cows and chickens, we would see how they what sort of image they have from us in their mind. I don't think the wolves can eat even one millionth of what we eat from them. So we are the most evil ones and we are not going to live peacefully with these animals at the time of Mahdi certainly we are going to eat them. Uh, so this should be something metaphorical that the lamb and the wolf would live together and the, the Baha'im or Saba will make peace. This is just the extent of the peace which is going to take place in the world. So much so that a woman would travel between Iraq and Syria. This is of course by the scales of that day is explaining for them. Now that of course a woman can go from Iraq to Australia with plane, nothing will happen. However, the way they wanted to actually make people imagine the type of security at the time, uh, a woman would travel between Iraq and Syria and would not step but on green vegetation. That means everything is green, everything is uh, fertile, all lands, and would have all her ornaments on her without fearing a beast attacking her or a man attacking her or whatever. It can go alone. It was unimaginable at that time, of course. So this is just. Uh, uh, somehow bringing to mind the type of security which is available at the time, inshallah. We hope we see that time. Okay, questions? Thank you very much indeed, Sheikh. Very interesting. Um, Sheikh, when you talk about uh, secular waste, uh, what do you exactly mean? Does it mean that, for example, those who don't believe in any kind of faith, they are known as secular waste or what? No. That faith should be completely separate from state. It should not have any social manifestation. It's something private. You have to keep it with yourself. You have to be ashamed of what you have. And if you want to come and take part in society, leave it behind. This is the secular West. And then there's all the values. I mean, you see, almost, uh, I don't know, how many percent of the values that now we have in the West against the values of the Bible, isn't it? So this is, this is what we mean by secular. Against the values of all religions, this is what we call secular. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any sisters? No brothers? Yes, sir, friends. Um, Salaam alaikum. Alaykum, sir. Two points. First of all, when we say secular, I mean, we don't necessarily maybe mean atheists, which means people don't believe in God. We're talking about people who are actually against the belief of God and are actively trying to stop it, as is happening today. Yeah, that, that's what we mean. Not those who are agnostic or they don't know yet, they don't believe yet. I mean, these people in, those, uh, in that uh, period of peace, of course, there will be lots of discussions between them and others. They may, may be convinced. But it's the whole system of the secularism which is going to come out against. It's quite conceivable because Imam is actually challenging it. Challenging. Now we have, for example, we had Imam Khomeini challenging the secular West. But they don't actually take it serious. It's not a big danger at the moment. But the mom is going to be in big danger. And therefore, of course, they take it very serious. And, and the second point was this peace treaty you were talking about for nine months to two years. Maybe this is a, just a fake peace treaty because, like the Iraq war, they already knew when they were going to do it and what they were going to do. And all this talking in the United Nations, this was just to fool people. Yeah. So yeah. maybe they need this time to plan. 
So have that, peace that's, peace. that's quite possible. And we have in traditions that it's not the Imam who violates this treaty, actually. It's them who violate the treaty. So if you're going to send a million men, you can't do it in one week. You have to yeah, nine to months, one year. Yeah, one. yeah. True. Thank you. Any sisters? No? Riyadh? Salam, Sheikh. Thank you very much for your lecture. Sheikh, we've, for the sake of discussion, um, group people into very discrete groups like the Ahlul Kitab, the secularists, the Imam, Jesus. But we know that people are actually going to be in a continuum and you're going to have people who are perhaps secularists or are benign. We have people who are idol worshippers but benign to the rule of the Imam. So you have Buddhists, you have Hindus. Yeah. What about people who fall into other categories which uh, we haven't defined? As I said, Imam is not going to fight anyone. I mean even this secular People, they start the fight with the Imam. Imam, what he wants is that period of peace, discussion, inter dialogue. And therefore, even those who, who are benign in this secular West, they will join the Imam or they will not take part in this battle. Imam is not going to bomb the West. As uh, here they, they picture it, that if this Mahdi that they say come, he would nuke the western cities and it is not going to happen certainly. There will be war, of course in the battlefield the things are different and after of course the war is won, as we said Imam would travel to the cities of the, now he is in control of every, in everybody. He builds most, he would not force people to believe. This is, this is what we understood from all these three. He would not force them. So again, they have their own choice. And still we saw that uh, whether people are wicked or, or benign or good and righteous, they are going to benefit from the uh, government, of, from that Dawlat al Karima. They are going to benefit from it. Yeah. Thank you. Any sisters? No, Firoz? This is just a thought that has just come to my mind. Um, if, as you described, that uh, the West, which was Rome, and we assume that that is now what we consider with the Western civilization or the Western, the affluent part of the world. Again, just sorry, yeah. I, I, I interrupt you. Again, what we say about the West, we, this is our understanding of Rome, what they talk about. Yeah. That's why we say the West. It might be wrong. There may be other blocks of secularism in the world which might come and it fight. It could be China, Russia, it could be in the Eastern. Maybe. Country. Maybe. Okay. The, the whole thing is that the secular world, whoever they are, okay. they will come. And even in some traditions, we have that China is going to help the secular camp against the Imam. So it might come from the, all over the world. The secular world will come against the believing world, so to speak. No, the, what I was alluding to, or going to, was that uh, there are people like us, okay, there are people who are Muslims, who have migrated to the West, uh, and some of them have no state, or, or, or it seems like they will not go back to wherever they came from, the second, third generation, fourth generation, whatever, because of many reasons, links, lifestyle, whatever, economic reason. Um, how are they going to react? Because obviously, if Mus and I talk about West in general sense, not more, I mean, assuming that this is the Western part, how are they going to interpret that? I mean, because they are so secularized, uh, live in a secular world and affected by secular values, even though they keep their faith, as we know now, we're living here, that uh, we have a problem. Or, and, and, and the danger is that we don't even realize that we have a problem or we could have a potential problem. So how does, is there any, any, um, uh, is there anywhere in the traditions of the role that this group of people will play? Because right now there's this idea that uh, Muslims in the West are going to be a bridge between the Muslims of the East and the West because they are now in both camps and they understand the secular side. And, you know, that kind of, kind of globalized thing where they will sort of kind of moderate and etc cetera, etc cetera, that kind of thinking um, I, I'm just sort of hypothesizing so is there anywhere in your research that the, the role of this because the danger I see is that uh, that group of Muslims are going to be caught and maybe they will fight them first 
<laughs> I don't let know. Me, let, me, let me give you an example. When Imam Khomeini came, how did you react? Hmm? Well, most of you were absorbed to him, isn't it? Now, Imam is 100 times more convincing and more attractive than Imam Khomeini. So, there is no problem. I mean, with people with good heart, there is no problem. I mean, an Imam is not going to come out as a brutal man killing anyone who has made one mistake. This is the sort of imagination which has been created for us. And therefore, especially now, what is your role? Yes, inshallah, if you see the time of Imam, that interim period when these dialogues are going between Muslims and others, you will create a great, you will play a great role, certainly. I mean, you are going to uh, arrange uh, conferences, seminars about the Imam, what is his mission, why has he come, what is he going to do? And then, inshallah, you will support. Yeah. So there's, there's no worry about that. But don't invite me after no third time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sisters. Yeah. No sisters? Brother. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, just regarding uh, your research on one of the hadith when you mentioned Armageddon. And uh, is this the word mentioned? No, 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 not in our traditions, no. But is, this is the word mentioned in usually in biblical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when we're into the Greek or Roman language, one very interesting point I found that uh, you mentioned one million mm. coming from the sea. Mm. If this is the research of those days, I mean, even in the Battle of Troy, you did not have one million. Mm. Genghis Khan did not have one million until the first second world second and first and second world war yeah. then we saw million mm. and then from the sea as well so this is interesting yeah. the, 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 this is an interesting message yeah 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 yeah, so. yeah. and uh, what, one point you reminded me what safra said he says it takes for them 3 years to prepare their ships mm. so they probably needed this uh, peace treaty to prepare for for this fight which is which, which is going to be very uh, crucial and decisive. No, sisters? No? Hamid? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Thank you for really an extraordinary, interesting uh, lecture. Two points, if I can just put them briefly. Um, back to the Armageddon point, which I'm kind of stuck on in, terms, in my mind. We know in the past that when the West has been up against a wall, they have been able to use nuclear weapons. And that's the great fear in the world today, the use mm. of nuclear weapons. I know the Imam al Islam doesn't have that facility, but the West do have that facility. Is there anything in the Hadith that suggests that they have been or they will be used in uh, that war? Well, of course, th there never has been this idea of nuclear weapon. Even if Imam would have mentioned it, people would not have understood it. Uh, but uh, well, if this is going to be very bloody and many people are going to be killed, it is possible that they use a couple of these bombs. Or there is another possibility that they are afraid to use it. They, uh, because Imam is supported by Ro'ab, by fear. And whatever the enemy is going to do is always with some sort of worry and concern. And this fear might stop them from using this sort of uh, weaponry. And the other point, just very briefly, it's really intrigued me, this ability to have people who are wicked, as mm. well as people who are good, but they're in some kind of control. In yeah. the whole history of mankind, there has never been control for yeah. people that are wicked. So is this a physical people on the streets controlling other people, or is this a psychological control of some sort? How do you control people that have a, a mm. desire to do wicked things? We don't know. Let Imam come and we see, inshallah, how does he do it? This is his government. <laughs> if we knew how to do it, we would have done it. So but there's no indication of how that might happen? Mm, I haven't seen anything, no. Thank you. Just a follow-up on this? Yeah. Sorry. One comment here, uh, which we have maybe seen a miniature incident, one regarding the treaty 
that when during the signing of Hudaybiyah, for example, mm. the two years afterwards, until eight after Hijrah, the number of people who became Muslims are many more than 19 yeah. years. Yeah. Another point also interesting that... Uh, actually, some people have made some parallels between this peace yeah. treaty and Hudaybiyah, saying that this is exactly like Hudaybiyah, in which the Imam gathers the strength, people would come to Islam mm -hmm. uh, in numbers. Yeah. And then the other point about these wicked people being under control, we saw Abu Sufyan and his people during the conquest of Makkah, that they had no choice, at yeah. least for a certain time there, to just go into this route and accept. True, true. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, any sisters? No, Zahid? Sisters are waiting to be one of the 50, so... <laughs> Sheikh, one of the arguments that often gets put to Muslims is around uh, Islam being spread by the sword. And the example that's oft quoted is that of the Crusades. So here in what we've discussed today, I understand everything we've said is uh, where Imam and his army is reactionary. However, the one point where we said there is an aggressive part and perhaps an offensive is around Al-Quds. Hmm. So in discussion, how do we explain well, Al-Quds is because actually Al-Quds is in the hands of Sufyani and Imam defeats Sufyani and go moves there. Again, in a sense, we can say that's not aggressive. Imam actually defended against Sufyani and Sufyani was defeated, of course not by the Imam, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The earth sinked. Uh, they sink into the earth. And now that Sufyani is removed, Imam moves to the Quds because now this is the place where the head of the army and head of the, the leader of the country is now, who was fighting the Imam, is now dead and Imam moves there. And he does not meet much opposition there. But throughout these uh, uh, course of events, we saw Imam never started a battle. Never started a war. It was always after peace. It was always after peace. And regarding Crusades, Crusades again, is, again was something about Palestine. It is, Palestine has always been this very controversial uh, place. And uh, uh, actually, Muslims did not open any land during Crusades, except, of course, this uh, Constantinople, which at a time they gained control and then they lost. And again, they gained, and, and, and it, this went on and on and on. But uh, of course, Islam is not whatever is in Constantinople. I mean, that's a small part. The, the, the Crusades could not be mentioned as an example of Islam spreading by sword. Again, any sisters? Sheikh, when you talk about Dajjal, uh, we, you explained that Dajjal, well, we, we had a story going around when we were younger that uh, Dajjal is one-eyed person, a cruel person, evil person, will be killed by Prophet Isa. And now These are the things we have in tradition, yeah. yes. But now, uh, now we have discussed that Dajjal is not a person, but is a culture. And maybe. <laughs> we said maybe. And he may be a person. But that person would be the representative of that culture, certainly. And we have in tradition that we have 70 Dajjals. So that means there are these people who come represent this sort of culture. Uh, of leisure and pleasure and uh, these things which are, of course, against human values. Where does the idea of one-eyed come in? It's, it comes from tra tra traditions to uh, make him more fearful, actually, one-eyed. And... <laughs> okay. Any sisters? Uh, no sisters? Last question from brothers? Anybody? No? Okay. Muhammad wa'ala, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.